it back. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy exciting. And, uh, you know, we all saw it from the sidelines, but, uh, our guest speaker here tonight, uh, Dr. Kaplan was part of it. I mean, she was part of the science and, the and the, the building of this mission. Um, and it's just terrific, uh, Hannah, to have you with us tonight. Um, Hannah got her PhD uh, back at Brown University, um, and she's a uh, space scientist currently at Goddard Space Flight Center, just up the just up the freeway from us here in Northern Virginia. And uh, it's uh, super to have you. I think you actually worked on the Osiris Rex mission back when you were at SWRI, if I'm not mistaken, yep. uh, in, in Colorado. So. Maybe it's been a little while, but I'm sure you'll be here uh, eagerly, uh, part of the science team when we when we get the the samples back. So, you're very lucky. I'm very jealous, uh, but I'm super happy to have you here tonight to tell us about it. So, uh, we welcome you to to Novak, and I'll I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, um, and thank you all so much for having me. This is my pleasure, really. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna hop right in, and I, I'm gonna start with a very brief mission overview. I think some people I know have been following along incredibly closely, others not so much. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll get us all on the same page at least to start. Uh, OSIRIS-REx is an incredibly tortured acronym that spells out what we are trying to do, what we were trying to do when we visited, visited this asteroid Bennu. Um, so the O stands for origins. Uh, we basically wanted to return a, some of the soil from this asteroid. Um, and we particularly wanted to return the soil because we think that it is carbon and organic rich um, and may tell us about organic material from really early in the solar system. I'll talk to you today about uh, the spectral interpretation and resource identification part of the mission, which is uh, essentially what we did when we got to the asteroid. We looked at it with all of the instruments on the spacecraft uh, to determine what, it, what it's made of, um, to try and understand spectrally you know, what this object is and where it came from. Um, I won't talk very much about the security aspect of OSIRIS REx, but one of the goals of the mission was to understand whether Bennu posed a hazard um, to us on Earth. And so it's a near Earth asteroid, it has an Earth crossing orbit. Um, and one of the things we're particularly interested in is the Yarkovsky effect. Um, so understanding uh, if the asteroid's orbit is basically being nudged in a way that would make it even more hazardous to Earth. Uh, the results from, from our analysis uh, at the asteroid seem to suggest that there was a very, very small chance uh, that Bennu would impact the Earth um, in a few hundred years, I believe it is. And that chance has now gone down to basically zero with the information that we have um, from the mission. And then finally, Regolith Explorer will be the, the end part of this uh, presentation uh, because I'll talk about how we looked for different sample sites and ultimately collected a sample of the asteroid. So, uh, you know, a big thing I've done is worked with the instruments on the spacecraft Primarily, I'm working with OVIRS, which is the Visible and Infrared Spectrometer. Um, and so this covers from 0.4 to 4.3 microns. We call this the visible and near-infrared wavelengths. There's also a thermal emission spectrometer, OTIS, uh, which covers longer wavelengths, tells us about uh, the temperature and the thermal properties of the asteroid. Um, there is OLA, the laser altimeter, uh, which gave us really high definition information about shape um, and bolder uh, distributions on the asteroid. And then OCAMS, uh, which is the suite of cameras that took all of these amazing pictures. Um, and finally, there's REXIS, which is an MIT-based student instrument um, ga gathering x-ray data, 
which I won't really touch on that I think, you know, was a really cool opportunity for students, um, but the science didn't quite pan out. Um, so the first thing is, you know, why go to Bennu? Um, and this was formally designated RQ36. And so the short answer is that it, it was an easy place to get to that kind of kicks out a lot of potential objects we can sample. Um, so it was easy to get to. We knew something about it from Arecibo observations. And you can see um, in that bottom spinning image, uh, our radar observations and the proposed shape model uh, from those ground-based observations, which is actually really cool um, because if you, you'll see in a minute uh, pictures of the asteroid, the, the predicted shape model was really, really spot on. Um, and then we thought at the time that there was evidence for regolith on the surface, that there would be easy material to sample. Um, and I'll go into in a bit uh, where that didn't quite pan out for us. Uh, but before that, I'll give you the like 30 second overview of Bennu's history. Um, and this isn't just Bennu, this is, this goes for a lot of asteroids, both in the main belt and the near Earth objects. But, you know, essentially we think that Bennu for, Bennu's parent body, so not Bennu itself, but a bigger body probably formed from the protoplanetary disk pretty early on. That body uh, experienced some amount of aqueous and thermal alteration. Um, so it probably incorporated some radiogenic isotopes, which caused it to heat up. Some objects heated up so much that they melted. Uh, others do not. Um, maybe just enough to melt some ice that's incorporated in that body and to melt that ice. Um, after a while, the kind of bigger body, uh, Bennu's parent body, was impacted, probably catastrophically, and it broke up and it created this smaller object that we see today, um, the kind of top-shaped asteroid. Then, you know, you kind of sit around in space for a while. Uh, you, there's... Uh, some reshaping and resurfacing that goes on as things impact you. And then ultimately, Bennu drifted into a position that led it to be moved from the main belt into near Earth space. Um, and then again, it's that, you know, we're talking billions of years of, of it being exposed to space, the space environment, and that does something to the surface. Um, it's being impacted by all sorts of particles. And so then you can imagine that this entire uh, set of uh, this entire history is then found incorporated into that final object that we come to visit in 2018 uh, with our spacecraft. So we're kind of able or hoping to look back into this deep history as we look at modern day Bennu. So this is the real cool part, um, which is the uh, observations we did at Bennu. And this is where I was really involved in the mission um, and where a lot of my research and professional interests lie are these sorts of spacecraft observations. And I'll just say, please, um, I, can't, I can't see the chat or anything because I'm presenting, but if you have a question, I'm happy to be interrupted at any time. So again, I, I, I noted that we thought that Bennu was going to have a bunch of regolith on the surface. Um, part of this came from ground-based thermal measurements uh, and thermal models, and also from having visited with spacecraft other objects like Itakawa, uh, which I show a picture of here. You can see this big, smooth area. Um, they call these ponds. Um, but the reality of Bennu was quite different and, and I'll say from being there on the science team was quite shocking, uh, just the amount of boulders. 
And it's worth noting that there was another mission going on kind of uh, at the same time as OSIRIS-REx, which was Hayabusa 2. Uh, if you read about OSIRIS-REx, you might have read about Hayabusa 2 as well, because they visited a very similar looking asteroid right around the same time. Um, and we both kind of showed up at these asteroids, you know, right around the same time with our spacecrafts. We were both trying to take samples home. And we both had the same issue, which is like, where do you sample on a body that looks like this? And I'll say for, from the OSIRIS-REx perspective, all of, our, um, all of our mission planning uh, and our engineering that, that went into our ability to sample was not prepared for this sort of service. Um, but uh, it was very exciting to the geologists on the team and, and I'll, you know, um, in an astronomy club, I hate to admit this, but I am a geologist at heart. Uh, that is my background, really. I'm very interested in the rocks. Uh, and Bennu has some really awesome rocks. So you can see, uh, you know, from the geology perspective, it may just all look like boulders, but there are definitely some brighter boulders, some darker boulders. Um, and it is kind of, you know, fractal in nature in a way. It, boulders at all scales. Boulders as, you know, the more you zoom in, the more you, the more you see. Um, and so I've shown here, I, I think it's really fun to look at these images and see some of the scales involved. Um, and so, you know, something like gargoyle saxum, this black rock uh, that stands out, you know, the size of a house on the surface, though it, you know it can be hard to imagine from the the photo, has this little six foot rock perched on top of it. Um, so you know one of the things we spent a lot of time on, um, you know, as geologists, is figuring out, okay, how does that get there? How do you get a six foot boulder up onto another boulder? Um, and, you know, there's a set of things that can only have occurred on the parent body. So, for instance, a large uh, impact could toss rocks up onto other surfaces. But if your impact is too big, Bennu itself is only 500 meters across. Um, so you can't toss really giant rocks with a really big impact because you just break up the whole body. Um, so that's the sort of stuff that we were very interested in, uh, in terms of looking at these pictures and doing photogeology on the surface. Another really cool thing we got from the images of Bennu is we were looking off the limb, and we were actually looking with the navigational camera, just trying to do um, some work to do feature tracking, ultimately to get a good sample site. Um, we weren't looking for particles or anything coming off of the asteroid necessarily. It was not expected at all. But it turns out that Bennu is an active asteroid. Uh, so it's spitting out particles that are dust size to, to, to about 10 centimeters um, in scale. Some of them will fall back to the surface immediately. Some of them orbit Bennu itself. Um, I think we tracked something like 16 orbits at most before falling back or being lost to space. Um, and so this is, you know, one of those cool things that you really only get with spacecraft observations. Uh, it's really hard from the ground to see this sort of thing. Um, but it's also really interesting because it's a bit of an unknown about why. Uh, the main theories at the moment are that there is a thermal process, so Bennu heats up and then cools down um, daily, and it's possible that that rapid and, and pretty intense heating and cooling can fracture rocks and toss out particles. It's also being hit by small micrometeorites constantly um, just as it travels through space. So it's possible that those are freeing other materials. Uh, so that's one of the kind of open questions, but a really cool finding from the spacecraft. 
So I was really involved in the mapping portion of OSIRIS-REx. I created a lot of uh, the spectral maps. Uh, so not necessarily those background color images showing the background images showing the boulders, uh, but more interpreting the spectral signatures to understand the distribution of different minerals and chemicals on the surface. So you can see what our spectrometer footprints might have looked like for an observation on the left here. And then in the middle, you can see how that translates into a map where each of those footprints is colorized based on some property. In this case, it is temperature being derived from a thermal emission spectrum and how that relates to the surface in terms of the boulders and craters on Bennu itself. Uh, so this is uh, a, this is actually an albedo map. So this just shows bright and dark areas, uh, but we can map almost anything. Uh, here's an example. This this is the temperature map. This is, this shows temperature across the surface at noon. Uh, you can see there's this one big rock. We call it the rock. Uh, all of Benny's features are named after birds and bird-like creatures. So the rock, R-O-C, is a bird from mythology. Uh, and so this is a particularly hot boulder, probably has to do with its thermal properties. Um, so its composition and even more likely the porosity of this rock is kind of distinct compared to the rest of the surface. One of the things we were really interested in at Bennu was looking for water. And we did this with OVIRS, the visible and infrared spectrometer, uh, which collected spectra in, in that visible range that your eye can see, but also in the near infrared. Um, and out near three microns, there is an absorption feature. And you can see it in the spectrum, which is mostly flat or sloped, and then has this feature here near three microns. Um, and that is due to either water, H2O, or hydroxide, OH, that is bound in minerals on the surface. Um, and so we see this, uh, this type of spectral signature basically all over Bennu. Um, so you can see, again, we can map, we can map all of these features. And so you can interpret this map as blue being less hydrated regions on the surface and red being more hydrated regions on the surface. So you can see that that central ridge of that top shape um, is actually less hydrated and, and the poles are more hydrated. Um, and so we can try to interpret what that means. Is the water being delivered via the solar wind? Uh, is the ridge being heated more or bombarded more by micrometeorites um, and therefore losing water more rapidly? Those are our primary theories at the moment in terms of what is causing this particular water distribution. We also see another absorption feature uh, at near 3.4 microns. Um, and so this is indicative of carbon and hydrogen bonds on the surface. So again, you know, you have that strong three micron feature from water. Here's another one that's associated with organics. Um, and so this is really, was really nice to find because again, we're really interested in that carbon rich material that we wanna bring back because we want to study these organics as potentially precursors um, to life on earth. I mean, these are the sorts of organics that may have been delivered to early earth on other from other asteroids like Bennu. Um, so as a, in a way, they're kind of, you know, they're not fossils in the way that, that you think of them on Earth, but they're, uh, they're relics of organic matter from the early solar system that we're really keen on understanding. 
And we can also look at spectral slope with our instruments. Um, so you may be familiar with more red or more blue objects uh, in space where red means that you have a more positive spectral slope uh, as in this um, showing of spectra and blue would mean you have a more negative spectral slope. Um, Bennu shows you know, quite a bit of variation. So you can see individual boulders here are more red. Um, some of the finer seeming material is maybe a bit more blue. Um, and we've been able to trace this pretty well to this concept of space weathering, um, which is just the, the irradiation, cosmic rays, and micrometeor micrometeorite bombardment that happens in space. Just then you sitting around in space, these things are bombarding the surface. Um, and they're changing that spectral slope. And our interpretation is, is that the redder things are, the younger they are, the more recently exposed. Um, so that's really cool because you can start to try and point out, you know, where on the surface is the most recently exposed, what is the oldest part of the surface. Um, and so that can help when we choose our sample site to understand, you know, what sort of material we're getting back. Bennu has six really bright boulders. Uh, really bright is 14% normal albedo. So if you looked at them, you would say that's not a very bright rock. But compared to Bennu as a whole, which is dark, like, you know, soot dark, um, they really stand out on the surface. Uh, and they have, when we look at them with ovaries, with that visible and infrared spectrometer, they have a very unique spectral signature that doesn't look anything like the rest of Bennu. Um, they actually have a signature that looks like this one um, here, where, oops where the black line is uh, Bennu and the blue line is compared to the spectrum of a near-Earth Vestoid. Um, and so these are just fragments of the asteroid Vesta. Uh, so our understanding is that actually pieces of Vesta have ended up on Bennu, uh, which we know happens. We know there is impact and contamination throughout the solar system. But it's really, really cool to be able to have these fragments of another asteroid on Bennu's surface that we can trace back to that original asteroid. So again, I'll, I'll remind you, you know, here's what we saw going into ben, uh, going in with before Osiris Rex. Here is kind of our understanding of Bennu's history. Um, and I'll just zoom in on that tarp, top bit, you know, the early formation to the breakup of the parent body turning into Bennu as a rebel pile. Um, and we can now start to add in some details. Uh, so we know that there were probably organic molecules from that protoplanetary disk that ended up in Bennu's parent body. Uh, we know that that parent body then heated up enough to melt ice, but not so much that it totally obliterated all of the hydrated minerals, which again, from the spectrometer, we can see the hydrated minerals across the surface, as well as organics. And both of those things are really broken down by heat, so you kind of put a limit on how much that parent body heated up. Uh, we actually think based on the hydrated minerals and the rocks that we do see that there was a fairly large hydrothermal system potentially on this parent body in which water was actually flowing through the body at like a meters scale. And then sometime during this early portion, uh, there was an impact from a Vestoid, from, from a piece of Vesta uh, that ended up on the surface. And then that was all before it broke up. 
and reaccumulated as Bennu itself today. Since then, we have that impact of that space environment, the space weathering that is impacting the surface continually to this day. Um, so, you know, this is not meant to confuse you or to, you know, put a zillion pictures on the screen all at once. It's just to show that we really have a much more nuanced view of what has happened to Bennu just from looking at it with this spacecraft. And that's really, you know, that was the goal of that part of the mission and it's really exciting. Um, so I'll go into sample collection. If, uh, if there are any questions about that, you can let me know now or we can get to them at the end. I think maybe we'll let you continue, Hannah, because it's going good, but we are accumulating questions that I want to let you uh, continue, though. So Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, just a few more minutes and we can get to questions. The sample collection, I think, is the really exciting part of this mission. Um, we have this uh, tag SAM, uh, which is a sample collection device that hits the surface and fires uh, nitrogen gas, which causes the regolith ideally to kind of shoot up into this sample container. That is, uh, you know, that was how we wanted it to go. Um, but again, it relied, originally we needed, I believe it was a 50 meter area of fine material. And there was no place on the entire surface that that was even possible. Um, so, you know, uh, the engineers did an incredible amount of work, um, mostly led by folks at Lockheed Martin, uh, who kind of introduced a new way of um, navigating the spacecraft in it to really lower that region um, of confidence that, that we could sample. Uh, and so you can see here are our final, the final four sites, uh, the final four potential sample sites, and those are, none of them are over 10 meters in size. That was about as big as we could find without any um, major hazards. And so for each of these sample sites, we, and I mean, this as we as in everyone, everyone on the science team, there were citizen scientists, there was an AI algorithm, everyone mapped every single boulder uh, down to 10 centimeters or so uh, at these sample sites. So you can see what this looks like, uh, what, what, you know, the boulder map looks like for the primary sample site, Nightingale. Um, and so, we were looking to have nothing greater than uh, 20 centimeters, I believe, in the sample site. Um, the tag SAM head itself can only take in particles up to about two centimeters. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of work to really get a full sense of every single boulder in these regions in order to perform that sample collection. So here's the backup site, again, the same sort of mapping. And just I like these uh, images they put out um, showing cars parked in there. So it just gives you a sense of, you know, kind of the extreme spacecraft maneuvering that had to be done in order to, uh, you know, get very confidently to a pretty small spot on the surface in order to sample. Um, but I hope a lot of people have seen this video. It's really incredible. We did actually manage to touch down within, uh, you know, about a hundred centimeters of where we, where we proposed to touch. Um, so with a pretty, pretty high level of confidence. Um, and you can see here, right as we touch the surface and then the gas fires and that causes us, 
to first it causes a lot of rocks to fly up and immediately causes us to back out. Um, and so this was actually a really cool scientific test in itself of the regolith properties um, because we had suspected from the uh, thermal data that the surface was very porous um, and kind of, you know, these boulders were very weakly bound together that you could probably go there and touch one and it might disintegrate to your touch. Um, and it, you know, it kind of proved true that as soon as we touched the surface, it basically disintegrated beneath us and we were able to penetrate 48 centimeters down, we think, um, which was more than expected. So clearly, you know, these are very weak materials um, that it's even more exciting because you think the other things that we have on Earth are meteorites, but meteorites need to come through the Earth's atmosphere in order for us to be able to have them, hold them, measure them. Um, material like this is never going to make it through Earth's atmosphere, uh, so we don't really know much about it, uh, which makes it even more exciting that we're bringing some of it back. And so that's the final section here is that, you know, it is now that the sample has been stowed, um, it is returning to Earth in September 2023. Um, it's kind of interesting, actually, because right now the you can see in this in this rendering that there's a sample canister that gets dropped back to Earth. The spacecraft itself with all of its instruments is actually intact. Um, and we are working on our proposal now to go somewhere else, uh, you know, because you have a spacecraft, it, it's operating with all of its instruments. Um, so we're going to see if we can go look at another asteroid with it, actually. Um, but, you know, I think to, just to end it all off, you know, why <laughs> I'm really interested in, in the things that we do in space, but, you know, I have to admit that the things we're able to do on Earth are really incredible. Um, and the, here are a lot of pictures of different lab setups that we are planning to use um, to understand the return samples. And it gives you a real sense of, you know, why you can't do it all in space. We just can't bring our most state-of-the-art instruments to space with us. Um, so it does really argue for, for bringing that sample back with us. Um, and, uh, you know, a really cool part of this is that about 50% of the sample will end up being saved for future scientists. Um, the idea being that they, there may be new instruments invented um, in, you know, in the future generation's lifetime that, that will give us an even better insight into these samples. And so that's the end of my talk. And now I am happy to chat and discuss uh, about whatever topics anyone wants on Osiris Rex. It sounds good. Uh, that's really a crazy, super interesting mission. Uh, I mean, it's just fascinating from an engineering perspective, but uh, also the science that I know that you're gonna, you're gonna. Get. I think I lost you. Can you hear me? Well, you're muted. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. That was great. Um, we've got a number of questions, and I want to try to uh, give everybody a chance to ask them. Uh, so um, one that I guess, I mean, I'll start off. I, I One of the statements you made was uh, the uh, uh, that we had knowledge of active asteroids. And I guess my question was, how do you, how do we know that? It seemed like it was maybe obvious if you're right up close watching one, but how do you know otherwise? Yeah, um, you, they have to be, I think the only ones we have looked, we know of before this are very, are fairly large objects. Um, so I think something like Ceres, um, you can see some amount of material being ejected uh, with ground-based uh, infrared telescopes, um, but it's it's big. 
is is the way that you're able to do that. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, something Benu says, you definitely can't, and it helps if your particles are are ices or or hazes and that have a specific signature. These small rocks, I think, are very hard to detect. Okay, let me see if uh, Manjunath Rao, if you're if you're on, you can ask your question. Uh, yeah, I had uh, two questions. Um, one is, uh, do you know the results from the JAXA analysis of the Hayabusa sample return? What was it? And uh, another one I think I had was, uh, when you say hydrated regarding Bennu, uh, what do you mean? Is it uh, free water molecules or uh, is it trapped water molecules? What do you mean by hydrated? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the sample analysis from JAXA is just starting to come out. I just reviewed someone's paper um, on that. So I think, you know, it's all very much, all everything I've read has been like, you know, we have, I don't even know how many, how many grams, but they, they, they definitely capture material. They're starting to uh, break that off into subsamples and they've done some initial infrared measurements that seem to match up well with uh, the measurements they made in orbit, so that's really cool. Um, I could I could go on forever. They, these are two very interesting bodies, Bennu and Ryugu, which is where Hayabusa two went. Um, Bennu and Ryugu they look very similar, uh, but uh, chemically, compositionally, they seem to have gone through through different things. Um, so they have slightly different amounts of hydration. And so that gets into the second question, which is, uh, is primarily hydroxide OH bound in clay minerals? Um, so no free water. Uh, we don't think that there's any ice stable on Bennu, though there is some ice on some asteroids. Uh, but uh, the thermal conditions for Bennu mean that water ice is not stable. Um, so yeah, this is all bound in minerals, though it's indicative of a pastime when there probably was some amount of free water flowing in the asteroid. Okay, thank you. Uh, is Japan going to share the samples with NASA? Yes, there will be some sample coming to NASA and I think shared internationally. So um, I know there are groups over, across the world who are getting some of this. How much um, how much weight did they actually bring back? Was it all just particulate material, or did they actually have you know uh, rocks, if you will? Yeah, no, they didn't bring back any rocks. I think you know, I think the biggest grains they had were like maybe a centimeter or something. They're pretty pretty small, um, mm -hmm. and I don't I don't know what the actual weight is. Their sample canisters held less than, so we were aiming for 60 grams, um, and they, I believe, were aiming for a fraction of that. Um, they're using, so their Hayabusa 2 spacecraft, um, Hayabusa, the first Hayabusa 1, went to Itakawa and brought back just a, a couple of grains, literal dust grains. Um, they got a lot more material this time but I think it's in the 10, tens of grams kind of range. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we have. John Birch, you had a couple of questions, I think, if you want to ask them. Maybe John is, let's see if he's still, John, are you still out there? If not, we'll go. I am. Can you hear me? Yep, oh, you're good. Okay. Uh, couldn't figure out how to unmute. I apologize. <laughs> I can't uh, figure I that out either. So. Um, uh, one of them, well, I've seen both uh, the the samples listed as soil or regolith. And do you distinguish between the two? And if so, what what is that distinction? No, I don't distinguish between the two. I think regolith is the nice term when you're talking about someplace other than Earth, because soil on Earth means something pretty particular. That's why um, I asked, yeah. yeah. So no, uh, regular, no we'll stick with regular. products. Yeah. Uh, the other is, uh, are the gravel, I guess is an appropriate term, uh, that you're returning, uh, is that large enough to hold uh, phenomenological uh, f fossils 
maybe identifiable for the to, to identify event phenomena impacts or anything like that yeah that's a really good question i think yes you know there are there are there's evidence of for instance impacts at the micron scale in in meteorites um so i think we'll be able to do that i think there is some you know the bigger the particle you're able to bring back the more intact and the more it holds within it um you know the you saw you saw the video of us sampling so i think there's some thought that we will any bigger particles may have been broken down further just through the course of us sampling but i think um you know we have a lot of really cool ways of understanding mineralogy and petrology uh that can kind of link back to the some of those processes i was thinking of something maybe related to the original parent body impact that might have fused particles in a pattern way that we often see in craters on the earth yeah and i think the trick will be you know kind of distinguishing that from the other smaller impacts that have occurred since but i think um you know some some amount of uh you know isotope dating and kind of really careful petrology is probably going to be able to tell us a time i mean we do a lot with meteorites you know there's a ton of information we can gain from a single small rock um it's i think we have a good shot of getting a lot more of venue's history the other question i had was about static charge on the uh, object uh, might that affect the stacking of particles and rocks uh, if it's strong enough yeah I, and that's a good question that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise but there's definitely um there are people who are looking at the possibility that static charge was causing some of the lofting of particles that i discussed um the particle ejection um and i think the ultimate understanding was that that force might not have been strong enough to to do what we've seen um but in terms of how it impacts you know the uh grain distribution on the surface i'm not super sure about that but i know that there are people on the team who are who are studying that sort of thing okay we'll go to uh let's go to kevin kevin black had a question for you uh, yeah, I just was curious how representative Bennu is of other asteroids. I mean, for instance, you mentioned earlier that uh, I guess one of the Japanese one saw these ponds, which were, I guess, had a lot of fine particles where Bennu had none. So I mean, or very few. But so what what do what do you all think as far as I mean, where does Bennu rate as far as all asteroids? I mean, 60 percent are that way or just no idea? Yeah, so it seems like Bennu is representative of a specific type of asteroids. Um, so normally we group asteroids based on their spectral signature. Um, so Bennu is a C type, uh, which the C is sometimes used to refer to carbonaceous. Uh, but essentially, spectrally, it is grouped with another large group, um, you know, of of asteroids and Bennu seems to be somewhat representative of those but there are so Itakawa is a different type it's an S type uh, and that does seem to be distinct um, I think we would have to visit more bodies to understand so there's an upcoming mission to uh, Psyche uh, which is a different different type and it's metallic um and so i think we're starting to visit enough places to kind of have a sense uh but you know the c types are something maybe 40 percent you know they're they're a good fraction of the asteroids in the asteroid belt but certainly not all of them uh paul i'm not sure your last name but uh had a question uh Kind of similar. Do you want to ask it? 
uh, uh, he was he was interested in the parent body. Um, and if you know, where is that now? You, you had a slide there that showed venue kind of maybe being created from another body. Um, yeah, we uh, we think that that parent body no longer exists, that the, that the impact that created venue essentially broke that parent body up into entirely, you know, pretty much small boulders and Bennu and maybe a number of other bodies formed out of that uh, mass of, you know, kind of broken material. Um, the, and that's, you know, that's kind of the story of the asteroid belt where there are some big things like Ceres and Vesta that didn't kind of catastrophically disrupt like this, but a lot of the other smaller things are likely, you know, were once part of a bigger object that now no longer exists. Is there a, I, I, the part about Vesta is really intriguing and, and uh, is there a reason Vesta versus another asteroid, they, do they, are they in similar orbits or are they in some other way kind of linked that it would be Vesta and not Ceres or not something else that you think these rocks might come from? Yeah, so that connection to Vesta is pretty, uh, pretty set because Vesta has a very unique composition. Um, it's, you know, I was, I was just talking about the C types and the S types. Well, there are V types, which are just all of these asteroids that came from Vesta and Vesta itself that are completely different from basically everything else uh, in the asteroid belt that we know of. Um, and, because they are different, they are compositionally different, they have a very different spectral signature, and we're able to see that particular spectral signature on Bennu, which is how we're able to pretty confidently say that, you know, these aren't from some other asteroid, they're from either Vesta or a piece of Vesta. Mm -hmm. uh, now then, actually getting them from Vesta to Bennu is a bit difficult. So so we kind of made that connection and then we had to figure out, okay, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, and so we dynamically really can't get things directly from Vesta itself. So it has to have been one of those smaller pieces broken off from Vesta, from a Vestoid. And it also, the boulders are big enough that they probably had to impact that parent body because if they impacted Bennu itself, they would have broken it up completely. Uh, so, you know, those are the sort of, that's kind of the pathway we went down with that. Okay, yeah, I wondered about the Vestoid versus Vesta itself. So that that, that clears that up. Now, I assume we, we would know if we got a piece of Vesta in your, uh, in your return sample, or are we not expecting that? Yeah, so they do seem to be pretty discrete boulders. We don't think we sampled directly over one, but it's possible that there's like, you know, that tiny fragments broke off. I know the PI of the mission was really excited about the possibility of getting a piece of Vesta back in our sample. Um, so we'll see. Let's see, Chris Roberts, you wanna ask your question? Sure. The Organic molecule shown on the slide was butane. I was wondering if there's anything more complex found um, and if they could tell by like spectroscopy what was on the surface and how do you go about choosing a site other than boulders blocking your way? Yeah, so the organics question is a, is a great one. Butane, actually probably no butane on the surface. Basically everything we think is more complicated than that. Um, a lot of the organic matter in meteorites, which is what we base a lot of our information off of, is this kind of complex organic molecules. Uh, if you're familiar with like carrageen on, on Earth, um, it's kind of similar to that. It's uh, like almost like tar, you, you can imagine, like a organic goop with a very complex set um, of, you know, bonds and bonding patterns. So it, it probably is not butane, but what we're sensing with the spectroscopy is just the carbon hydrogen bonds. So the ultimate molecule may be more complicated, but we're really only 
looking at that single bond level. So um, what we're seeing are these carbon hydrogen chains that are probably, yes, part of a more complex organic molecule, but that's kind of what we see when we look with the spectrometer. Um, and I forgot your second question, so could you ask that again? Um, sure. Um, other than boulders, what goes into choosing a sample site? Yeah, so originally these things, uh, the hydration maps, the organics maps, where those things were located on the surface were of the utmost importance. We wanted the most hydrated and the most organic rich sample we could get. When we got to Benny and saw the amount of boulders on the surface, we kind of immediately had to replan that. So ideally there was a scientific driver behind the sample site. Ultimately in reality, you know, there was a uh, spacecraft operations based constraint on where we could go and that basically settled it for yes. us. Hannah, when you said the probe went 42 centimeters, is that where we pulled material from or did the actual physical probe penetrate that far? Yeah, yeah. so I think uh, it happened recently enough that we're still working on kind of like scientifically what happened, what can we learn? Um, and I know we're putting together a paper right now on you know how does the sample site look before and after, things like that. Um, but yeah, I think one of the big things we're trying to back out is w what depth exactly did we get material from? And I'm not sure I've heard an answer, but I'm not, I'm not the person working on it. So, uh, you know. We got a uh, good imagery though, of, the, of the site after we touched it. Yeah, um, and actually that was not originally planned uh, because from a safety perspective, you basically want to stow the sample and you want to go. That's the yeah. only important thing, but you know, as a scientist, we we pushed and eventually, you know, they decided to do a whole nother imaging campaign and spectral campaign. And it's really cool. And we're just starting to kind of look at that data now, but um, you know, it did change. You can see boulders that were in one place and, you know, pretty big boulders, we think were moved tens of feet. Um, spectrally it changed because new material was kind of shown on the surface so it is it's i'm really glad we got those uh, final images uh, and we're still kind of figuring it out very cool uh R robert barnes you want to ask your question and if he's not on i'll ask it um Basically, it's a good question, I think, about contamination. Um, you know, we stole the material, bring it back, and then we fly it through the atmosphere of the earth. And, um, and what, what's the process? Is there a contamination concern? And then uh, what happens to that sample from the time it hits? I guess it's going to Utah, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's actually Nevada, but oh no, I think it is Utah, you're right. Um, <clears throat> No, yeah, so so contamination is a big deal and there have been kind of plans in place for this for uh, many years now. This was a big part of this mission planning. Um, and so the capsule that the sample is in is meant to protect it from contamination from the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, it's it's airtight. It's hopefully not letting anything in even um, it has a small parachute on it. I think there is like a contingency where even if the parachute doesn't deploy, that it can survive that re-entry and, and um, hit to the surface, hopefully without opening. So, you know, it's something that people thought a lot about, but essentially it will immediately be brought to um, a clean facility uh, at JSC, I believe, um, and, and be treated as, you know, as cleanly as we are able to do. So, you know, our state of the art clean labs, it will be kept under vacuum and at fairly cool temperatures uh, for the most part, if where possible. And some of it will immediately be 
put into our, you know, most careful deep storage with the goal of, of not contaminating at all. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I think some of this, uh, is going to be tested for the first time with the sample, but I think that we hopefully have planned well enough to keep contamination from being a big factor. Okay. And David, you had kind of a similar thought. Do you want to ask? Yeah, I was just wondering if nitrogen was used to push the debris back up to the collector there, does the nitrogen itself impact or have any effect on your samples? I think the hope is that no, that nitrogen, it's nitrogen gas, it shouldn't react, we hope, with the sample itself. Um, so that's my, that's my understanding. That's, you know, the, then you get outside of my area of expertise potentially, but hopefully no. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Did anyone else have a question? I'm kind of looking at the chat box here. I think we covered them, but uh, we still have a couple minutes. A super interesting talk, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, will you get to actually uh, see the samples and, and uh, hold, hold part of venue in your own hand, or how does that work? I'm hoping there's a group um, at, at Brown where I did my PhD that will be doing the infrared measurements of the sample uh, back on Earth. So I'm hoping to be involved with that. But, uh, you know, really my, my interests lie in space for the most part. So I'm already, you know, I'm thinking about where the spacecraft is going to go next and also some other missions. Um, I've been working on a mission called Lucy that launches in October um, that will be going to a number of Trojan asteroids, um, so out near Jupiter, uh, and we'll have a similar infrared spectrometer on that. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I think there are very qualified people at Goddard and also, you know, all over the world that will be doing a lot of the lab measurements and I will hopefully be looking at more uh, pictures of asteroids. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, any, any, any final questions for Hannah? Uh, I had one more. Sure. Uh, it strikes me that there will probably be external contamination of the vehicle that returns the sample. Uh, has there been any interest in that? Yeah, um, it's it's really interesting uh, because uh, we've been trying to. There's there's a possibility that it's contaminated on its way in, but also that it's contaminated with pieces of venue. And so there's been been a big question of you know can we get even more sample out of this contaminated or not by looking at the capsule itself. Um, so that's kind of interesting, um, but yeah, I, 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 I guarantee you that someone has thought about it, but <laughs> I'm not sure I know, you know, exactly what might happen. Um, is this, this capsule hits the ground lands or is it captured midair type of thing? No, it hits the ground. Hopefully not too hard, but it, it, you know, it could be entering pretty fast if the parachute doesn't work. Yeah. Have some kind of uh, telepon telesponder to locate it. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's. I think it's going to touch down in White Sands. It's you know it's out in the desert. Okay, that's cool. Uh, any any final thoughts from anyone? Um, it's a great presentation, Hannah. It was super. Like I said at the outset, it's just an exciting mission from from. Uh, engineering standpoint and and, uh, and of course science is really uh, cutting edge and it's what inspires I think the younger well the younger and the older generation so um, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing about the sample return and uh, and actually Lucy so we'll uh, we'll certainly uh, try to invite you back uh, to talk about that mission too at some point yeah yeah happy to chat anytime that'll be, that'll be really neat so Thank One you more. so much, uh, Hannah, for your time. And uh, for the rest of the Novak folks, we have a whole bunch of activities, as you, as you know, coming up. So take advantage of uh, nice weather, clear skies, and uh, 
you know, please uh, don't forget to vote. <laughs> That's the most important thing in the next 24 hours. So uh, thank you, Hannah, and, uh, and uh, do great things. We'll, uh, we'll catch up with all of you later. Thanks.